thanks for joining our panel on the Young Africa on the Move, focusing on the young entrepreneurial side, tech and philanthropy in Africa. We've heard it clear and loud today in the other Africa panels held at DAD, Africa is at the frontier of business. With unprecedented growth in the natural resources sector and the services industry, at last Africa is turning a corner. By 2035, the labor force will be larger than China. 15 of the 20 fastest growing cities in the world between 2015 and 2020 will be African. We heard this morning from 1.2 billion to 2.2 yeah. billion in 2050, right? Yeah. Okay, so our three panelists perfectly fit this year's DLD motto of optimism and courage. They share the big passion, the big passion to change and significantly contribute to the legacy of their home country, Africa, through academic excellence, social entrepreneurship and philanthropic endeavors. Which brings me first to Okendo, Luis Gale, who is the founder and chairman of Harambians. Harambi means all pulled together in Swahili. It is a Kenyan tradition of community self-help events like fundraising or development activities. Harambi is a network of young and highly educated African entrepreneurs who are spearheading social and business ventures in Africa, scaling ventures such as Andela, Flutterware or Yoko. Okendo advises, amongst others, Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Ma, the Vatican, Rhodes Scholars, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative on African Investments. He's furthermore the inaugural Schwarzman EAR at Xinhua University in China and a graduate of Harvard University. Okendo's claim to fame is that in 2007, after hearing Okendo speak, President Barack Obama famously said, I'm glad that Okendo is not running for president yet. <laughs> so, Okendo, I met you at... <laughs> uh, he has nothing to worry about. <laughs> Okendo, I met you at the House of Lords in London, where you presented the African Uber and Airbnb entrepreneurs, and I was so impressed how brilliant they all are, and how they all feel a responsibility and a strong desire to give back to their countries. So please tell us about Harambi and he, how it all came together and the Young Africa on the business and social impact move. Well, thank you so very much, Michaela, for that kind introduction. And thank you, Steffi, for bringing us all together. Uh, I have to admit that these, the, I've already learned a great deal because the last time I was here was Oktoberfest. And I was so drunk, I didn't realize that there was much else around here. <laughs> uh, I don't know if there's a... Uh, uh, DLD Oktoberfest, but if there is, we should do that. Please, I would never be here. <laughs> <laughs> October, I'm telling you. Um, well, thank you. I, I guess DLD Oktoberfest ideas yeah. no one remembers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, think about it. The collaboration would really we would bl we would bond together very much. Um, I think one of the things that's very important for me uh, to remind folks at forums like this is uh, over 2,000 years ago, there was a, a Roman author by the name of Pliny the Elder. And Pliny mentioned ex Africa al uh, semper aliquid novi. Out of Africa, always something new. And I genuinely believe that uh, that's never been more true than now. Um, the reality is that if technology can af help Africa leapfrog, and if need is the mother of all great inventions, then it's very clear to me that Africa will be the laboratory for many of these technologies. And that may seem counterintuitive to many, but I like to remind folks that before America had Apple Pay and China had Alipay, um, Kenya had M-Pesa. And that is not the last time we're going to see that. Um, the continent has all of the main ingredients to make the most out of this technology and continue to surprise the world. And we have already begun to see that. And I believe that it's just the tip of the iceberg. And with Harambe, we work with a growing number of young African entrepreneurs. Harambians have raised over $300 million from investors such as Jack Ma, uh, Mark Zuckerberg. And they are a sign of what is ahead. And I, I, you know, I was at the session with Kai um, uh, Lee, and he mentioned that I think uh, when it comes to AI, Europe may not get even the bronze. 
I do think that when it comes to Africa, Europe has an extraordinary opportunity to engage the continent very much the way China is doing. And I really hope that more and more people realize that it's not just a challenge, there are real opportunities across the ground. How do you select your um, Harambians? Are there criteria and where, with whom do you work and how does the network work? Yes, well, each year we have about 3,000 uh, folks who apply to Harambe. We select about 30 of them and then we have our, invite them to join us at our annual uh, gathering at Harvard in Brentwoods. Uh, and actually, Masiwa joined us as well uh, a couple of years ago and is one of our members. Um, and I know that a lot of people worry about trust sometimes when it comes to entrepreneurs, and I'd really like to take on that challenge. If you look at ecosystems that are very mature, entrepreneurial ecosystems such as Silicon Valley, what you'll see is they begin to develop signaling mechanisms. Uh, if you are an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley, well, there's a lot. But if you are a Y Combinator entrepreneur, all of a sudden, allows, it allows you to have a lot more credibility and resources begin to migrate towards you. And in a sense, that's what's happening now on the continent. And Harambe is part of that signaling to investors and entrepreneurs uh, about what's possible. But you all constantly exchange ideas, right? You morph and you meet and you discuss ideas and, yes. and all of that. So Correct. this is the advantage of this network. Yes. Um, one of our, we, if you look at an ecosystem like Lagos, there we have, thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> no worries, thank you. You'll hear it all, Stephanie, later. I'll tell you everything. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think the, one of the most important things that is happening in Harambe and that you've seen in more developed ecosystems is the recycling of the knowledge and the network that happens. So part of some of our most successful entrepreneurs are now investing in younger Harambians and they are literally sharing everything from lawyers to accountants to best practices, facilitating introductions, and that really helps the process accelerate. And, and that's the kind of collaboration that Harambe is helping um, drive on the continent. <laughs> okay, so let's go to Elizabeth then. Elizabeth Tanya Maziava is also a Harambian, uh, tender 27 years. She has her one foot in business startups as well as her other foot deeply in philanthropy, both with the aim of sustainable and scalable youth-led social change for her country. She's the managing director of Delta and the co-founder of Simba Education, a leading African edutech company focusing on early year education in urban slums. And she uh, experienced that very much growing up, right? That there's a need to, to get engaged later on. She strategically advises on long-term investment at the Higher Life Foundation, for which she also is a board member. Elizabeth also co-runs a social impact investment fund on behalf of her family office. It has to be said that her parents, especially her mother, mentored Elizabeth in philanthropy, and both parents are the Zimbabwean role models concerning business, governance, mentoring, and philanthropy in their own right. Well, I must say, I saw you all have strong mothers. No, yours is an opera singer, yours is so incredible in philanthropy, and yours was a, is a, was a finance minister in Nigeria. Anyhow, that's just a side note. Elizabeth serves on Harvard's Leadership Council on Africa and prior to her current role was an analyst for UNICEF's Innovation Venture Fund. Last year was the finalist of the Halt Prize Challenge, a startup accelerator for young social entrepreneurs. Elizabeth, when we first spoke and you told me all about your activities and roles, I wondered how you allocate and combine business and philanthropy in the many boxes you store in your life and also how they cross fertilize each other. Maybe you explain your mission and the targets you have for your country, short, mid and long term, and tell us about the school you're opening in February. Great, thank you, and thank you for having me, and thank you for all of you who've shown an interest in Africa. Um, as we heard earlier, um, in the next couple of decades, if not shorter, we're gonna account for 40% of the world's population. That means that we're an entire population that just cannot be ignored. That some of the things that we've heard about in this conference, AI, 
sustainable foods. If we do not invest in Africa and Africa's youth, then the impact of all of those things is not going to be effective. Mm. So we're sort of at a juncture where you either do something about Africa's growing population or you leave it to chance. And I think I'm one of those who is doing something about it. So I'm in the business of investing in young people. Um, I am a uh, member of a board member of the High Life Foundation, a Shesi um, Foundation, which founded the first liberal arts uh, university in Africa. Um, and I serve on a number of boards that are education focused. And the reason why is that if we do not invest in young Africans and start to develop young African leaders, then we are leaving both Africa and the rest of the world to chance. And, and that's something that's a little bit scary. Um, when it comes to the cross-section between tech, business, and philanthropy, um, my father is an entrepreneur, my mother is a philanthropist. And philanthropy has this unique ability to provide risk capital when it comes to investing in innovation and investing in young people. Um, so that's really what I do. And it's really because of my own personal journey. Um, I moved to San Francisco when I was in my early, early 20s, and um, naively started my own tech enterprise. Thought it was going to be easy, like every other young person, and I went through the journey of starting my own startup. Um, and did not want any help from my parents because um, I knew how to do everything. And after having seen the challenges of starting a business in an African context, I began to see how young people who don't have access to the same resources and knowledge that I have must really be struggling. And so I teamed up with my mom and we co-founded a social impact investment fund to invest in young people who would have been like me but didn't have the network works, the funding, and the kind of opportunities that I have. Um, and so I wear many, many hats. As a startup founder, my startup is doing very well, and I'm very proud of it, but also investing in and helping young people with their ventures. And we're opening a leadership academy um, in the next couple of weeks. Nothing like the African Leadership Academy, we are different. Uh, we're really looking, trying to address the needs that are in our nation, Zimbabwe, and on the continent as a whole. So we have asked some students who are 16 years old to come out of school and spend a year with us, where we teach them about subjects like artificial intelligence, where they've got a great computer science um, program that's coming in. Uh, we're teaching them about our nation, Zimbabwe, because when you look at our curriculum, it hasn't really been updated since 1987. Oh. So the kind of history that we're learning is not relevant to us. The kind of curricula and our method of learning, it's not developing problem solvers. Um, and so we decided you know, stop high school for a moment and let us invest in you. Let us spend time with you and try to foster these skills and then go back to high school at great institutions. And we've been negotiating so that um, the ALA can take some of our students. <laughs> um, and that's really what the school's focused on. And the other one is for people who've completed their um, undergraduate studies and it's focused on agriculture because agriculture is really the lifeblood of, of most African economies. So that's what we're focused on. I wonder how, how much to, to with content, um, content um, text plays a role in the whole, in the overall. And I was asking you recently also, also thinking of Uzo's book about the little guerrilla boys who have all these traumata. How do you deal with a lot of children who are orphans, etc.? I hear all about academic excellence and, you know, fast forward and teaching. But on the other side, there's a human side. And I feel like a lot of African children have suffered, at least as much as I hear. And I wonder how you deal in these schools with this theme. Because to be, a, you know, a full human being, there's the tech side. But then you have just you know, you would neglect another side. So I would ask you, are you also yeah, focusing well, on this side? or Yes, we are. So program? I think Fatuma uh, mentioned in her panel that um, when it comes to Africa, we don't have to choose between social good and business, that it's so interlinked. And I'm on the board of Cassava Smart Tech. We are arguably Zimbabwe's first unicorn. We went to IPO and closed at $3.8 billion. Wow. And um, we are really focused on technology, it's a business, but that meet human need. Um, so technology allows us to address some of the needs that are 
found in an African context at scale. So one of our businesses in the cassava group is EcoCash. Zimbabwe is a cashless economy, and so we're using our mobile phones to transact between each other. And that is one of the major breakthroughs we've seen on the continent. In Kenya, they have M-Pesa. In Zimbabwe, we have EcoCash, but M-Pesa has cash. Zimbabwe, we have no cash. So it's become mm. such a huge integral part of our economy. And we've done the same with EdTech. Um, we had seen how young children, we were paying their school fees as the foundation, and yet they were going to school, sometimes rural areas where teachers didn't show up, or there are no textbooks. So we founded um, a tech platform called Ruzivo Education, and we have 1.6 million children who are um, using our platform, Ruzivo, and this, these are children that are in peri-urban and rural areas. So no children in the city and 1.6 million to enhance their education and to allow them to be able to one day access more opportunities. And you focus also on the human side. You have like psychological yes. education and help and, and all of that. Yeah, we okay. do. Okay. I mean, you cannot have technology yeah. without human interaction. Okay. So, I'm very so we work <laughs> with teachers and our foundation has offices in every region and The individual child is our priority. My last question is, do you think you can scale your business also to other nations? Because I hear always the different countries are different, you know, like Kenya is different from Ghana and, and Zimbabwe. And how does it work? You think it, you, can, you can use your model, you can scale it also? For other nations or? Definitely, definitely. And we have received a lot of interest. We are currently expanding our tech platform um, for education into Rwanda. Um, and for me, I'm a huge champion of design thinking, right? When you create solutions, have your user at the forefront of it. But one thing in design thinking is that when you're designing a solution, try to design it in the toughest condition in which it can be created. That way, it can be used in a lot of softer conditions. And I believe that if I can prove that my technology platform works in the toughest of conditions, which nothing can be a little harder than Zimbabwe at the <laughs> moment. I believe it can be scaled even to developed countries where there are challenges like refugee camps. Our technology can really be effective in those kind of contexts. Fantastic. Fantastic. Okay. Then we go to Uzo, as I see the time is running. Um, Uzo Dinma Inviala is an award-winning writer, filmmaker, a medical doctor with Harvard degree, besides being the CEO of the Africa Center in Harlem, where I have the honor of serving on the board together with him. Also with Halima Dangote, Hadel Ibrahim, Chelsea Clinton, Maya Hoffman, and Jendai Fraser, just to name some of the participants. His famous awarded novel, Beasts of No Nation, was adapted into the movie Our Kind of People, and his last novel, Speak No Evil, was published in 2018. He was CEO, editor-in-chief, and co-founder of Ventures Africa magazine, covering evolving business, culture, and innovation spaces in Africa. He was also the founding CEO of the Private Sector Health Alliance of Nigeria, organizing and promoting private investments in health services and innovation in Nigeria. Uzo, you tell us best what you do today and about the Africa Center. What is its mission and how are you contributing in New York and in Harlem specifically and elsewhere to leave an important footprint for the present and the future? So to speak, the legacy of your home country. Sure, I often laugh when I'm on these panels because I'm always with the money people <laughs> and I'm like the guy who just tells stories. Um, but that said, I mean, I think it is really important. So what, what I do, whether it's, it's writing novels or making films or in this current um, sort of iteration of life at the Africa Center, it's really about narrative. And I think one of the most important things that underpins anybody's desire to be involved in um, a space, whether we're talking about any country on the continent of Africa, whether you're talking about Europe or whether you're talking about the United States, it's about the fundamental narrative that people engage with when they when they interact with that 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 entity it's about sort of the idea of a place um and you know oftentimes what we've seen is that the idea of africa in sort of global popular consciousness is one that isn't as complicated as it needs to be um and i use the word complicated very sort of like deliberately um complicated meaning that there's a lot of positive that is is associated with the place but there is also a lot of challenge associated with the place that is what makes a complicated human being you're not going to fall in love with someone who's goody two shoes right mm -hmm. at the same time you're not going to to fall in love with someone who's a, a total jackass um <laughs> 
And I think that's one of the problems that we've, we've been dealing with on the continent. So at the Africa Center, it used to be called the Museum for African Art. Um, now it is the Africa Center. And what we look at is like, how do you transform the narrative about the continent you know, through culture as sort of the primary means that people interact with the Africa Center? So we're talking about visual arts, music, literature, film, all the fun things that we, we, we like to deal with. Um, then obviously there are two other realms that we work in, business and policy. I mean, these guys have already covered uh, the business side of things, entrepreneurship, um, engagement, investing, and that's one of the things that we're, we're setting ourselves up to do. Um, and then of course there's the other idea of policy, um, which is you know, just understanding the political environments and contexts of the African continent, which again is narrative. I mean, how do people consider what's happening in Europe right now, it's through the stories that you read. It's trying to understand what is the narrative, like what do Europeans think of themselves right now? What do British people think of themselves? And why do those stories, why are they diverging or where do they intersect? The same is true within countries on the continent in terms of some of the issues that we deal with politically. It's true across countries and it's true in terms of the narrative for the whole continent as well. So that's what the Africa Center is about. And that's honestly, whether you're writing fiction, whether you're making films, whether you're, you're painting, or performance, like that's what it is about. How do you generate an image or an idea of this place for people that really resonates and that brings them closer um, in a complicated way? And you want to bring the community in, no? That's for also sure. An yeah. And so, factor. as a as an institution, we're based in New York, but with the idea of being global. Um, but you know, New York, there are a lot of African immigrants, there are a lot of African Americans in the diaspora in New York, um, and then of course the wider New York com uh, community. And the whole point of the Africa Center is that it's a fundamentally welcoming place. Mm. You don't need to be African to walk into the Africa Center, just like you don't need to be African to visit the continent of Africa. So all y'all should come. I'll give you my number if you want. You can call me up. I'll take you around. Um, but all right, 617. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but uh, but the, the thing is, like, it's, so the idea is really creating sort of a new kind of institution that is fundamentally a gathering place in which people can walk into um, and feel free. I mean, and this is not to knock regular museums, but I mean, I think there, there is a certain attitude that people adopt when they walk into a museum. You're suddenly very quiet. Like, you know, your arms are by your side. You don't want to touch anything or break anything. And what we want to do is create a place that's fundamentally interactive, that is, is essentially fun, that when you come in, you feel that the education isn't just about what's on the wall. It's about the way that you interact with, discuss with, um, speak to people. In, in other words, our collection is our people as opposed to necessarily the objects that we have. And I think if you look at the way museums are going in general, people are moving away from the idea of static collections into sort of more dynamic experiences because that's how you really learn. You just had your first theater play, no? We did, yeah, actually just two days yesterday, ago, I think. two days ago, we just we had a, a play called Hear Word, which was a Nigerian play that we brought over, um, you know, brought the community in and people really enjoyed it. Now to the three of you. Um, as we are, have all this theme, courage and optimism and everything. Mm. And I think that is what you all transpire and what you live, you know, and what you do every day. But do you have also concerns, worries? How do you see short, mid and long term challenges for Africa and business and philanthropy? And um, yeah, by any means, uh, can you project the development and the changes for the country? Can you can you feel except, of course, that there are more people? Do you have like projections where you think? I mean, I'll, I don't know if you, I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, I think that if you're not worried about any context in which you live, then you're probably not alive. Um, <laughs> and I think that's true for the continent or for the United States or whatever. I think any dynamic environment is going to inspire some form of anxiety, but I think that's actually a really good thing. So, you know, the mm -hmm. things that make me anxious, obviously, one is when you do have large population growth and you are going to have multiple young people, it's not just what are they going to do, like what jobs are they going to have? And again, this is what Okendo and Elizabeth are working on. But I think it's also very much about how do people participate in political processes, right? Like how do people feel valued? Yeah. Um, and I, I would say that in a lot of ways, for us, the worry is that we're not innovating enough on some of those non-tech related things, but like innovating in terms of political processes. Like, what can we dream? Like, what's the wildest thing that we can think of? And I, you know, that's why these conferences are good. I met someone yesterday who's talking about forms of radical democracy, which I think would apply um, and could be used like to, to, to a great extent on the continent. But these are the things that worry me is that we're not being 
bold enough in some of the social innovations that we'll need to really prosper as a continent. Very interesting. So now we have three more minutes and I wonder if anyone in the audience has questions. Hi. Um, yes? Hello? You can just shout. Yeah, I just, I just shout. So uh, Jan and I, we're co-founders of Seed Forward. We're working in the uh, regenerative agriculture field. And uh, we both lived in Africa. We have uh, a lot of contacts with the development work uh, in general. And uh, one thing that I would put out as a bold statement is that development work in the past has been business development for global companies and inherently failed. And um, what we experience locally is often that um, mm. basically what's missing is funding for local entrepreneurs. There's so many innovators out there, there's so many young people that want to drive change, but they can't because they have to pay interest rates of 20% or 30%, um, especially in the agricultural field. It's really, really hard. And uh, yeah, I wanted to know what's your take on development work and how we could transform it into a useful tool for real development. Are you willing to not go to Sheryl Sandberg's talk? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll let you. Um, well, I, I definitely can agree with a lot of the sentiments and concerns that you have. And I think the investment needs to be in two parts. The first part is we have to invest in the skills um, of our young people who need this kind of investment. And that's the work that I do. It's the work that Okendo does. And then we need to give them actual capital investment. And I think we also need to see these young people as individuals who are smart, bright people with a lot of potential. It's funny to me that when I'm in the US or when I'm in Europe, anyone who's 25 years old with their own business is an entrepreneur. But then when you get to Africa, they're a beneficiary of development. They are an entrepreneur and they too have some bright ideas and they're just looking for a chance. Um, so I think it's also about the perspective in which how we view young Africans. Yeah. And if I may just add to that, I, I think the problem you've noted is a very real one. Um, it seems that if you need upwards of five, ten million dollars, there's a whole host of private equity groups willing to bend over backwards to get you that money. Uh, if you are at the um, lower end of the spectrum, there is a whole host of uh, microfinance institutions willing to say, well, here's ten dollars. Uh, but if you are some in the middle, you better start praying. Because <laughs> the reality is that there are not a lot of viable options. Yet what we're seeing, however, is more... Um, of as some of those local entrepreneurs begin to succeed, they are now recycling that capital. And they are beginning to inspire others to come on board. And I, you gotta think of it as an avalanche of, in a way, right? You need sort of that local traction that, that gives us confidence and then that attracts more and more capital. And the good thing about the moment in history that we're in is that that's beginning to happen uh, in places like um, uh, Lagos and others. So. Uh, what you're seeing now is a temporary, not a destiny. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think, but just to also go straight to your question as well, I mean, the truth is, right, the way that small businesses develop is through small loans from local banks, essentially, and interest rates of 20% aren't going to do it. I think the idea of access to capital is also really important, but let's also not forget that in, around the world that there, you know, the it is in some ways a fiction that everybody just has access to capital, that people are still locked out of systems. So I think one of the things that we can do is look at programs where, you know, specifically things in the United States, for example, where they've had minorities get better access to capital, things in other countries where that has happened, so that it doesn't just seem like it is an African problem. It's a problem everywhere, where if you're not part of sort of the the, a certain group, yeah. you always will have problems accessing capital. Um, that's one. Uh, two is that, like, you know, we all know that a lot of development aid wasn't necessarily meant to, to do things for people on the ground. Um, but that's as much as it <laughs> Okay. So I think we, I'm staring at these two zeros here, and I think we have to stop as we are already over time. But thank you so, so much, everyone. And of course, you can ask everyone afterwards our questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michaela.